bring it up to speed with some more modern concepts which have arisen from experience with aware state surgery. Uh, aware state surgery is where the patients are sedated, the surgeon's using an endoscope, and as he progresses up and down the nerve, so the patient can say, oh, that's sore, but it can also teach the surgeon where that pain is distributing. And that can be very, very interesting. One bit of housekeeping, because the features being described are common to many aspects of the spine, um, you may find it a little reiterative, but that is deliberate. I've also made the sides rather fuller than I would normally. I would normally do bullet points, but I want you to be able to sit there, not have to take notes because it's all there on the slides afterwards, which Gazelle will send to you. So the aim, the message today is to really draw your attention to newly derived, or I say newly, 20 to 30 years worth of concepts concerning pain and the changing uh, influence that they have on claims. The presentation thread would start a little bit on my background. Uh, take in the major part the example of whiplash and look at some relevant anatomy <clears throat> and the pathology sources that have been derived from that. And something that we call the diagnostic cascade, which is very helpful in trying to refine uh, opinions for the court and the application of all this to low back pain and then your chance with some nasty questions. So please think of those. So I initially started with an, as an orthopedic spinal surgeon and I would uh, uh, do everything from the top of your head down to your little toe. <clears throat> I became a spine surgeon versed in conception, com sorry, conventional perceptions of spinal pain sources and mechanisms. I had a good predecessor in my first main job, but inevitably that left to a trail of failed back surgery in outpatients. So I thought it, I must try and find a new way forward and so developed um, aware state endoscopic surgery some 30, 35 years ago. So I've done 10,000 keyhole aware state cervical, thoracic and lumbar endoscopic interventions and of course conventional interventions. In addition, 60% of my practice has inevitably been tertiary referral for failed back surgery and I have really uh, focused on aware state surgery and gaining the knowledge of real time feedback from interrogating structures with the patient and looking at those endoscopically. And this has given me uh, insight into both spinal pain and mimicking paraspinal pain. So I believe I re represent a member of the responsible body of spinal surgeons, according to Bolam. But my expert reports reflect both the conventional concepts, but with a little added understanding from the real time feedback. And that's what I'd like to try and share with you today. Looking at whiplash and its mechanisms and epidemiology, whiplash is just really a muscle and ligament and facet joint strain. And the conventional concept is that this comes about from a rear end shunt normally or a slight variance of that, causing extension of the neck followed by flexion. But research in 1998 has shown this slightly more complicated pattern. It's S-shaped in its injury. In the first phase of the S-shape, the upper levels flex and the lower levels extend. And then in the second phase, all levels extend. But in that first phase, the C5-6 and the C6-7 levels, the lowest levels in the neck, they undergo quite a lot of capsular elongation and elongation of vessels and contain nerves within the spinal canal. But similar injuries in sportsmen and women tend to resolve over three months. 
and in cases of physical assault where there's no litigation, there are no particular complaints of chronic pain. Now, the range of movement in, in a neck is 60 degrees of leaning backwards, 80 degrees of flexion. You should be almost able to touch your chin on your chest, 90 degrees of rotation, 25 degrees of lateral flexion, with nodding and rotation taking place mainly at the base of the skull on the so-called and properly named atlas vertebra. But in Lithuania, there's no expectation of symptoms or disability, and only a minority of car drivers are insured for personal injury, and acute, I'm just going to move that, I can't read my own stuff here. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, acute pain after whiplash is frequent, short-lasting, but self-limiting. Sorry. So is chronic whiplash syndrome in fact a man-made disease? It's the result of expectation and psychological overlay. That is accepting where there is not neuro neurological deficit, protrusions and annular tears. So the other problem that experts have is there are no really good controlled clinical trials. So whiplash symptoms will present immediately in, a, in nearly 40% of the patients, 60% within 12 hours, 90% within a day. And the typical symptoms are, as you know, neck pain, stiffness, occipital headache, thoracolumbar lumbar back pain, that's back pain between the shoulder blades, and upper, upper limb pins and needles mainly affecting the upper part of the upper limb. Five to 10% develop subacromial impingement syndrome, fancy lingo for pain arising in the shoulder or apparently so. And 38% describe irritation of the brachial plexus. This is the nerves as they amalgamate in and around your clavicle and 50% the upper limb pain is associated with weakness, but that only develops about a week after injury. Now, throughout this talk, I'm giving you some percentages, but the reports are very varied, and I've tried to take the sensible mean for these numbers. In more severe impacts, of course, you may get protrusions produced, um, or high intensity zones, which we'll talk about in a minute, or annular tears with nerve root irritation, radiculopathy, producing pins and needles in a pattern that we as physicians would e expect for a given nerve. And similarly, they may get motor weakness of a predictable myotermal distribution. And that's important for when it doesn't fall into those patterns. And this can be combined with modest brachial plexus injury, which will manifest as burning and stinging and numbness and loss of feeling in the arm and an inability to control and move the shoulder, arm and wrist and fingers. But the mechanisms are interesting. We've looked at this S-shaped pattern, but it produces muscle spasm and an antalgic posture, a posture where the patient tries to keep off the painful area or tilt away from it, or sometimes towards it to gain relief. There is aggravating uh, facet joint overriding, so that's pulling on the capsules. The problem is having torn the capsules, those facet joints can then slide into the wrong position and narrow the pathway by which the nerve exits the spine, the so-called foramen. And then this irritates the exiting nerves. And it's very difficult to see that on the given handful of tests we have available. And the patient will have abnormal muscular tension, an altered neck curve, and this induces suboccipital entrapment headache, 
and trigger point irritation with neck pain, shoulder pain and pins and needles in the arm. So you're seeing an overlay of pins and needles in the arm and in the neck arising from for different reasons. And it's up to us to try and decide what those are. In terms of outcomes, um, the outcome for the future of the patient or the client is worse if the onset of pain is very rapid and is very severe and sometimes merits a hospital admission, and if it radiates strongly into the upper limb and produces a, a concurrent headache. Signs, again, if there's a neurological deficit, if there's the numbness, if there's the weakness associated with the stiffness and neck tenderness. Outcomes are worse the longer the symptoms endure. 88% of patients who attend an A&E department are symptomatic at two months and 93 at three months. Some may improve. Sorry, can I just say that again? 88% of those attending A&E are asymptomatic without symptoms by two months and 93 by three months. Some may improve over two and a half years, but usually improvement is very minimal after the first year. So of all outcomes, 50% of all patients make a full recovery. Four and a half percent are permanently disabled. The remainder, the remaining 45%, have some residual symptoms. So the received wisdom is that Psychological somatization crescendos with chronicity. How about that for using a bit of Latin? So what I'm saying is somatization is um, the hypervigilance, the overconcentration on small symptoms and conceiving them as large symptoms in simple terms. Now that tendency gets worse the longer the pain sticks around, and I can well understand that. But if you really look at the research, there's limited in evidence to support an association between low self-efficacy, low self-esteem and greater post-traumatic stress producing long-standing whiplash syndrome. And there's no association with that between that syndrome and personality traits and general psychological distress the well-being and social support, life control and psychosurgical work factors. Now that faces, that, that stands right in the face of all the psychological reporting that you are currently receiving. So, sorry, there you go. What we have to do in giving you a balanced report is in the, in the face of a lack of conclusive findings and quality studies to differentiate between the role played by degenerative changes in the neck, which are present in 14% in of patients asymptomatically without symptoms, balance that against apparently psychological vulnerability and chronicity effects, and of course against greed. So at the moment, there are still 500,000 whiplash claims a year. Set that in balance in Lithuania, none. In Canada, in Saskatchewan, uh, they replicated much the same when they took away PI insurance for whiplash injuries under most circumstances. Studies are poor and often you can't see an organic cause for the ongoing symptoms. However, I think that malposture does play a big role. Um, facet joint overriding where the facet actually irritates the nerve. And both of these result in trigger point irritation. And we'll look at that in greater detail in a moment. And they may, in some more severe cases, be associated with annular tears and high intensity zones. These are 
either a tear in the disc wall or evidence of aggravated degeneration in the disc tissue itself. But of course, bear in mind that that is found in quite a few patients already asymptomatically. And then we have the psychological distress crescendo to bear in mind. So the answer is to apply what we call the diagnostic therapeutic cascade. And we'll discuss that in greater detail in a moment. I'd like just to jump now to uh, a limited bloodless anatomy review. So I think you're probably all aware of this, but there's the sp looking at the back of the spine, there's the spinous process. And between these are the yellow ligaments, the ligamentum flavum, and then here are a number of ligaments which get torn in ver for various reasons between the facet joints, between the transverse processes. Um, here are the facet joints and in the middle there you see the water jacket that's holding CSF around and nourishing the descending and ascending nerves. So, Let's just look at the anatomy in action. It's showing flexion and extension, but actually it's an elliptical pathway. But as the disc degenerates, so it will bulge onto the nerve as it leaves the spine. And you'll see the swelling there. That's a junction box in the nerve, uh, which the sensory fibers uh, move into another fiber to go into the brain. But as that facet joint um, swells so it starts to press on the nerve and it may cause starvation of the nerves blood supply producing symptoms called stenosis and equally the disc may degenerate and lose tension and the vertebra may slip forwards or backwards further compounding jack be quiet uh, further compounding the nipping of the nerve, which really doesn't form much of the concepts of a conventional spinal surgeon because they simply don't see it when they come in from the back of the spine. Endoscopically, we come in through this doorway and walk up the nerve, seeing some of the problems that accrue. So let's look at these spinal pain sources. First of all, on the basis of concepts born from anaesthetized surgery and cadaveric dissection, such as you see on the right. And in essence, the thinking focuses on discompression of nerves, disc back pain, vertebral instability, facet joint pain, and the narrowing effect on nerves. Okay, so here is a, 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 a disc protrusion swelling backwards and pressing on the nerves on this MRI scan. And the disc protrusion effect depends on its position. Is it in the midline or in the doorway and by its degree? So as it gradually increases, it produces uh, pain, then numbness, then weakness, and then loss of function manifest as paralysis. Discal pain. I think that's very controversial, and I'll cover that more with you. But um, when you get the slippage of one vertebra on another, the disc gets distorted, and then it can produce pain. What we found endoscopically is that a disc is painful only when it's inflamed. And it explains some of the findings that took place when surgeons put anaesthetic into the back of the back and then operated, and they deduced that the disc was causing the pain because they didn't examine the nerve. The facet joints also can produce pain, and that comes about by pinching the nerve from the back of the spine or by narrowing the spine bilaterally here is a more normal volume at L5, but at the L4-5 level, you'll see it's been crimped. And here you'll find true foraminal narrowing from the disc uh, osteophytes and bone spurs. 
Now, what about the concepts from real time aware state surgery? Well, we feel that the foramen is the site of repetitive impaction on the nerve, causes scar tethering, facet joint overriding, which is misinterpreted as instability pain. Discal leaks, high intensity zones, and annular tears are important. And so is postural malalignment. And so are the trigger points of the cluneal nerves and cervical spine. So what's it like to do endoscopic spine surgery? Well, when you go down into the spine, wouldn't it be lovely if you found the, the foramen clear as you might do, say, in a knee? No, it looks like this. And you've got to decide, I don't know if you can see my arrow, um, there's the edge of the nerve, here's the facet joint, but importantly, here's the superior foraminal ligament, which is cutting into the nerve, especially if you lose disc height. But then what's it like to touch the nerve? Here's this beautiful nerve with the vessel on the back of it, and to the left is the foraminal ligament, and the blue stained disc is very soggy because it's very degenerate, and you can see it's pushing up on the nerve, and it's also tethered to the nerve, and the nerve is tethered to that ligament on the left. So when you touch the surface of the nerve, it produces axial and local back pain. Deeper pressure causes pain to radiate down into the limb along a nerve, but sometimes that is not the nerve you, distribution you might expect. Sorry. So the annulus is painful only when it's inflamed. And this forms the basic concept of foraminoplasty, which is to enlarge the doorway, mobilize the nerve from all those ligaments and scarring and restore its normal function thereby. So looking at the anatomy again, here's the superior foraminal ligament and the impacting uh, facet joint. And the disc wall is pressing up on the nerve. You see the nerve is attached to the facet joint by scarring. And this is aggravated by additional scarring if the repetition has occurred a lot and caused a lot of bruising and micro bleeding or the patient's had surgery. So here you, are some of the things you see which are a little unexpected. Here's a malplaced screw in a fusion procedure pressing on the nerve. I had to dissect away the scar before daring to remove the nerve lest it tore the nerve. And here is one of these radial tears producing nasty breakdown products from its mouth onto the adjacent nerve and causing a lot of aggravated irritation. But then what about the extra spinal cases? Why are they important? Well, the extraordinary thing is they mimic um, sciatica in the lumbar spine. You'll see here are the cluneal nerves. And I have to admit to my own shame, I've only really known about these for about 12 years. So this is, these are the distributions of the pain you get from the various cluneal trigger points. And you'll see on the left that the pins and needles and pain can go right down into the foot or in the middle, right down to the top of the foot. And it reproduces a lot of buttock pain and thigh pain. And again, in the neck, uh, it's soft tissue strain and spasm. The malposture is perpetuated. And then they get neck pain and pain into the arm as brachialgia and it mimics neuropathy. Here, this lady has got suboccipital um, entrapment pain. It's actually something my father first described, gosh knows how many years ago, and it radiates up over the scalp and into the back of the orbit. But there are a myriad of other trigger points producing fairly typical local patterns of pain. And they overlap uh, what a surgeon might think is pain coming from the spine or an injury post uh, accident, which is a causing troubles in the spine, but can't see them on the scans, but would feel them if he examined the patient for these trigger points. So I'm not 
really qualified to talk too much about psychology, but the psychological functional overlay is certainly considered by an awful lot of people to be very important. And it starts, of course, with childhood environment, how the family treated the patient, uh, what abuse took place, their level of esteem, and their, sometimes their IQ. And then this develops into depression, anxiety, maybe associated with things like Asperger's. And somatization develops, and with it increasing fear in a vicious circle, and increasing hypersensitivity. And the unrelenting chronicity in the presence of a hopeless diagnosis and treatment failures aggravates this still further. But of course, one has to be careful of uh, the client who is manipulating, embellishing, and confabulating, and bring forensic skills to bear. And what are some of those? Well, um, feigned abnormal gait. The patient comes in, <clears throat> or client comes in with sticks or crutches, and you can see they're temporary because they don't hold them right or they're not set right. Um, the absence of consultation, restlessness. They sit quite comfortably in front of you and only become restless when you start to draw attention to it. They access the examination couch with oohs and ahs and holding their back quite inappropriately. And again, the same goes for the neck movements, the discrepant neck movements, the moving around, gesticulating, and then suddenly with examination, it all seizes up. Abnormal reflex behavior, abnormal patterns of numbness and hypersensitivity, which we discussed earlier, and irregular, irreproducible power in, say, the toes and so on. And the saintly flicker, flicker you know, I'm just giving you a little bit of power movement because I haven't really got much, but in fact, you can determine that it is really there. The straight leg raise is so well known that it's often rehearsed by other family members, but they're not so familiar with the slump test, which is actually much more informative. And of course, you must rule out the role being played in the presentation by the shoulder or hip. So I want us to talk about the diagnostic cascade. Of course, that starts with clinical history, symptom patterns and clinical examination, and then our old friends, x-rays and various forms of scans. But I um, divide in the lumbar spine the problem up into paravertebral displacement pain when you actually move the patient. Sorry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, paravertebral displacement pain, pain when you displace the midline or uh, touch various trigger points. So the origin of paravertebral pain may be facet joint or foraminal nerve pain or paravertebral uh, cluneal trigger point pain. And you can work out this by carrying out CT guided facet joint blocks or preferably foraminal root blocks, CT guided facet joint blocks, the steroid contracts through the torn capsule at the front or round the side of the spine into the doorway and mimic the results of foraminal root blocks. And the benefit comes from the release of spasm and that uh, repetitive irritation in the foramen. And therefore you think the problem is facet joint rather than foramen. So the treatment is either to repeat the injections or go to foraminoplasty or go to ablation of the involved trigger point. In the midline, the cause may be protrusion, extrusion, slippage of one vertebra on another and high intensity zones. But stenosis is rarely uh, provoc provoked, if you like, by displacement because the patient is usually so stiff and arthritic. And again, CT guided nerve root blocks, muscle balance physiotherapy will help to guide you with the scans as to the role of these pathologies and the need for microdiscectomy for aminoplasty or fusion. But the trigger point displacement, either in the neck or the lumbar spine, is best uh, sussed by 
injecting those trigger points with steroids and treating the patient with physiotherapy and reformer pilates and treatment in the longer term is by repeating these or proceeding to radiofrequency ablation. So often you ask us to prognosticate, but you cook the books. You use the balance of probabilities on 51% to 49%, but I think you'd have our guts for garters if um, we're not getting the diagnosis in clinical terms, in clinical practice, much closer to 99 plus percent. So the first thing in prognostication is to look at the expected outcomes from various procedures. So microdiscectomy, uh, they will have a 90% relief of leg pain at a year, but not back pain. Stenosis, 80% of limb weakness is relieved at two years by adequate decompression. The spondylolisthesis with a fusion will produce 60% relief of back pain at two years. So these are not desperately brilliant results, are they? Total disc replacement, 60% relief of back pain at two years. Foraminoplasty, now I'm a bigot, of course, um, but this is all peer reviewed, published, 72% relief at 10 years, both of leg and back pain. I just thought I'd put in a pitch for it. So in terms of low back pain epidemiology, and I will keep this much lighter, but 70% of the population will suffer with low back pain during their lifetime. The annual incidence is about 45%, published results vary. 20% of the population will see their GP about back pain every year. And the cause of 13 percent of work absences is low back pain. But on the whole, 90 percent settle within six weeks. But seven percent go on to become chronic low back pain. Bear in mind that 50 percent of those aged 50 and 80 percent of those aged 80 have multi-level disc degeneration. And the causes are injury, degeneration, sepsis, malignancy in 1%, compression fractures in 4%. Intriguingly, only 1% to 3% is attributed to prolapsed disc. And this is the difficulty. Injury may just be coincidental or amplifying underlying factors. So the provocative mechanisms are flexion combined with rotation, such as in road traffic accidents or falls. One year after a road tra traffic accident associated with low back pain, 30, 30 odd percent of patients have low back pain, which is nearly three times greater than the natural population. So there is a link. And in 63% of low back pain following a road traffic accident, the back pain can be attributed to that accident. So that I think is reassuring to our legal colleagues. And again, all the features that we outlined under whiplash may be considered in cases of negligence and road traffic accidents. Again, the role of psychological overlay is more closely related to chronic cases. And again, the role of trigger points, posture, foraminal irritation, high intensity zones, and underlying motivation of the patient play a very strong role in future outcome. Pain is caused by a large number of complications and that I can't deal with today if the subject is too big, but you will know most of those in your referrals, your instructions. But let's look at the attribution of low back pain to trauma or negligence. Firstly, in per personal injury, it is related to the forces involved and their degree, uh, whether they're vertical, horizontal or rotatory. So a direct fall uh, or indirect rotation, such as you see in whiplash or impact or from some sort of uh, injury with a stone or something like that or a block of wood or landing abnormal, abnormally. 
You then have to take into account the prior history. Were they asymptomatic or had they had a reasonable prior history of neck, arm or low back pain? How obese are they? And what is their posture like? And how active were they? Were they taking part in sports and walking? Or did they have comorbidities such as fibromyalgia? So then turning to the clinical findings, do they have the trigger points? Do they have the ridiculous symptoms? Do they have uh, clinical signs of high intensity zone or protrusion or nerve irritation? And then you combine that with the radiological findings, bearing in mind that large percentage of asymptomatic similar findings in the background. And then the element of functional overlay, embellishment, the prior claims, the response to previous psychological treatment. And of course, one defers to the expert psychologist. And in terms of workability, are they trying to get back to manual sedentary or something that some form of work that requires ambulatory fitness? What was their prior absentee history combined to this post-traumatic uh, incidents? Uh, sick leave of two years or more is a very bad long term sign. And the work objectives of the client or their retirement pl plans. And all of this has to be balanced against the prevalence of normal low back pain and asymptomatic pathologies. Looking just quickly at that, please, this sort of a chart may phase you a little bit, but if you look at the age, each decade is a different color. And if you look at the next two columns, you will see loss of signal in the disc, so signs of degeneration, loss of disc height, forms a fairly graduated um, progression throughout life. And the same goes to the same sort of extent of bulging of discs as they lose disc height. But disc protrusion and annular figures, uh, fissures, uh, develop gradually uh, and to a lesser extent. But intriguingly, uh, facet joint degeneration and spondylolisthesis doesn't develop asymptomatically until much later in life to over 50s. So taking that into account in the prediction pathway, there's an activation event, and then looking at low back pain without symptoms into the legs, um, 90% of patients or clients will return to work within three months. If they're longer than three months, that's not a good prognostic sign. Total disability after one year, there's only a 20% likelihood of the patient returning to work. And after two years, only 2%. And when the patient does have sciatic radiation, conservative care will treat successfully 62% of protrusions because the discs will resorb. The average duration of symptoms is about four months and only 14% require some surgical intervention. So then I would recommend that in order to refine diagnosis in the more complicated cases that the patients entered or the clients entered into the diagnostic cascade taking into account prior and natural history, and particularly their hereditary history. Twin studies have shown that heredity is a much closer predictor of, of long-term outcome than almost any of the other factors that we've been looking at. We look at the functional overlay and malposture, the presence of trigger points, and active spinal pathologies. So in summary, um, when you ask us to produce a report, we have a number of ponderables to take into account. The asymptomatic incidents, which will be used by defense against uh, the claimant. The natural hi history of their symptoms before the accident and their family heredity. 
the expected treatment outcomes from interventions, their prior clinical history and things like uh, comor comorbidities, their prior work and claims history, the radiological findings, though those may be unreliable, the clinical findings, the psychological enhancement, the quality of life expectations of the client, and I'm afraid the old man gain. And all that has to go into our report for you. So when crafting a report, we do need to take care. We need to look out for high intensity zones, be cognizant of foraminal irritation and trigger points and malposture, and employ the diagnostic cascade before you run into trouble. Thank you very much for listening. I'm open to questions. Um, we have a couple of cases we could look at if you are happy with time. Does Over anybody you, have, has anyone got questions? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of class. Question, please. Martin? Yeah. Yeah. I can't quite so, hear. Martin, it's Sarah. Can I ask a question? Sarah? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So when it comes to informed consent for the back operations, um, does does this differ at all depending on how risky or less risky the, the back operation might be? That's a very good and very current question in the light of Montgomery, yes. Um, personally, I take the view nowadays that uh, we should all inform the patient to the very best of our ability. And it's not so difficult. When I started in orthopedics, I had to be able to sort out things from the top of the head to the little toe. Now surgeons will be upper limb surgeons, knee surgeons, hip surgeons, etc. So they will have um, eight, ten uh, procedures to offer the patient. It's not difficult to produce a pamphlet that explains what the procedure is, what the complications are, and with it a consent form as the last page. That's what we did. Um, I think that appertains, and certainly does in my practice, to injections as well as more complex surgery. And in these days, most surgeons should have um, a website and on that uh, it would have the detailed papers if the patient wants to see them. Um, it's a good way of staying up to date. So the patient should have our own pamphlet. They should be able to see that at least two weeks before the intervention, if it's a open in a proper intervention. I think with injections, um, less time is, in, is needed if you can really explain to them, but they must read that pamphlet before they sign the consent. The hospital consent forms are, I think, largely a waste of time because they give you two lines, in my experience, to fill in um, you know, a myriad of complications. And then if the patient's signing it on the day of surgery, they've certainly not had time to contemplate and reflect. So we should have our own forms um, built, preferably showing nowadays uh, your own statistics, your own outcome statistics. Most hospitals are monitoring that. And indeed, the hospitals should have such pamphlets on their own website so that patients really don't have an excuse not to be informed. Now, of course, the more some of the more elderly population or those who are poorer and can't necessarily have their own access to the web so easily, then the paper handout is essential. Does that answer that question, Sarah? I, I don't see a great deal of difference between the two. I think they all need that sort of detail before they go forward, because even an injection can go wrong. I mean, I've seen a few problems. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Martin. 
I've been rather um, negative about uh, uh, MRI scans. Um, I've got a couple of slides I'd be very happy to show you if people would like to see that, that sort of will make you question further too much reliance by your experts just on uh, the reports of an MRI scan, especially where the experts not looked at that scan himself or herself. So, um, the problem with MRI scans is that they are inert, they don't move. Here's a mobile, a dynamic CT scan, and you'll see here where the arrows are that the doorways are being nipped by the abnormal posture. And here it's a very arthritic spine. You, you can see the uh, rounded bubbling effect around the vertebral body rims. You can see the facet joints are suffering with the same. And that if you compare the holes at the top, they're much smaller at the bottom. And so those nerves are proving to be very vulnerable. And because the movement patterns at the bottom are rather fixed, the third one up is having to do a lot of the hinging movement. So MRI scans are immobile. Um, they don't really show you the facet joint overriding to its full extent because they're done with the patient lying on their back. And the shoulder osteophytes are difficult to detect. You'd see those better on the CT scan. A, they underestimate uh, the perineural scarring, the scarring around the nerve, and indeed the tethering of the nerve to the disc or those ligaments. And then the next thing is they don't take into account something called plexiform fixation. Now, you're all familiar with that diagram at the right with the green and yellow showing nerves coming out, forming the big nerves in, say, the leg. But you'll see the pathways are quite complex. And as they come out, if you look at the one uh, picture above, you'll see that there is a lot of intermixing between those nerves as they come out. So sometimes I will find myself touching the L5 nerve root and getting what I would expect to be S1 dermatomal patterns. And that's why a diagnostic root block, which would only anaesthetize that particular nerve in that position, is really very valuable in that diagnostic cascade. And you'll see the same, exactly the same in the neck. Here's the brachial plexus, which gets torn in mo motorcycle accidents or falls or heavy weights falling on the shoulder at various places in the spine, either where the roots come out of the spine in very severe cases, or tears here above the clavicle or below the clavicle where the nerves are transgressing or traversing the bump into the leg, oh, into the arm. So, and look at this for misleading uh, patterns. Patient presents with back pain, L5 pain, that means the nerve that should be coming out of this doorway um, radiating to the great toe. But it could be that this substantial disc protrusion is catching the L5 nerve root at this level. So the symptoms were intense, in fact, at this level and reproduced at this level. So um, if I'd operated on L4-5, the patient would not have got better. He was a banker, uh, so there's possibly less sympathy there, but he told me that when he was um, uh, 17, he was playing rugby and he had a nasty injury which laid him out for about six months. And I believe he's had that disc protrusion, had had that disc protrusion for about 30 years because I only operated on the L3-4 level and um, he got better. He's still walking around with the big disc protrusion. And he, we have discussed the possibility of uh, polymer rebuilding of the L5S1 disc in the future. 
and there are multiple pathologies. Here you will see the nerve is tethered to the disc. You'll see here there's a big extrusion in the doorway. And here there's a leaking disc. And all of those pathologies were addressed endoscopically rather than just by an L45 um, microdiscectomy. And finally, I would say here are lots of, uh, here's a patient who's had a fusion. You can see the images of the screws. But what really matters is the fact that despite doing that, the surgeon never cleared the, the pathway for that exiting nerve root. And you'll see that it's tethered to the ligament, ligament above, above and onto here. And tethered onto the bone spur there. And at this fused disc. So. I think because time is beginning to run out, I'd be happy to stop there. Unless you have any further questions. Gazella. Um, anyone else has any questions? I will send the slides. Uh, I've got the slides. I will send this after this meeting so you all have it. Sorry, I didn't yeah. quite hear that. No, no, I was telling that I've got the slides. I will send these slides to the solicitors. So I should now end my show. Yes, hi, right. Hmm. Anyone has any questions? I'm sorry that there's a lot in that, but the handout will give you that to hand. OK, thank you so much, Mr. Martin Knight, for giving your time. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing it. And thank you to all the solicitors to take time out from their busy schedule and be with us. I hope you had a, a fantastic webinar. Uh, webinar. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very bye. much. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Thank you, Gisela.